December 5th, 1902, Volume 4. Louisa sees a woman crying over the state of the peoples, who asks her not to move from her state of victim. As I was in my usual state, blessed Jesus shared his pains with me, and as I was suffering, I saw a woman crying her heart out and saying, The kings have joined together and the peoples perish, and not seeing themselves being helped, protected, but rather stripped, they get lost, and kings without peoples cannot exist. But what makes me cry the most is to see that the fortresses of justice are missing, which are the victims. The only and sole support that holds justice back in these times most sad. You, at least, do you give me your word that you will not move from this state of victim? I don't know why, but I felt so resolute that I answered. This word I cannot give. No. I will stay as long as the Lord wants it. But as soon as he tells me that the time for this penance is ended, I will not stay even for one minute more. On hearing my unshakable will, she cried more, almost wanting to move me to say yes with her crying. But more than ever resolute, I said, no, no. And crying, she said, so there will be justice, chastisements, slaughters, with no sparing. However, as I related this to the confessor, he told me that out of obedience, I should withdraw my no. December 5th, 1903, Volume 6, How the Holy Desire to Receive Jesus Makes Up for the Sacrament in Such a Way that the Soul Breathes God and God Breathes the Soul. Since this morning I could not receive communion, I was all afflicted, though resigned, and I thought to myself that if I had not been in this position of being bedridden and of being victim, I would certainly have been able to receive him. And I said to the Lord, You see, the state of victim subjects me to the sacrifice of depriving myself of receiving you in the sacrament. At least accept the sacrifice of depriving myself of you to content you as a more intense act of love for you, because at least thinking that the very privation of you proves my love for you more sweetens the bitterness of your privation. And as I was saying this, tears were pouring from my eyes. But, O oh goodness of my good Jesus, as soon as I began to doze off, Without making me wait and search for a long time, as usual, immediately he came, and placing his hands on my face, he caressed me and said, My daughter, poor daughter, courage, the privation of me excites the desire more, and in this excited desire the soul breathes God, and God, feeling more ignited by this excitement of the soul, breathes the soul. In this breathing each other, God and the soul, thirst for love ignites more, and since love is fire, it forms the purgatory of the soul, and this purgatory serves her, not as just one communion a day, as the church allows, but as a continuous communion, just as the breathing is continuous. But these are all communions of most pure love, only of spirit, not of body. And since the spirit is more perfect, as a consequence, love is more intense. This is how I repay, not one who does not want to receive me, but one who cannot receive me, depriving himself of me to content me. December 5th, 1916, Volume 11, The Good That the Soul Who Lives in the Will of God Does. I was doing my meditation, and according to my usual way, 
I was pouring all of myself in the will of my sweet Jesus. In the meantime, I saw an engine before my mind, which contained innumerable fountains, which spouted waves of water, of light, of fire, and rising up to heaven, these would pour upon all creatures. There was no creature who was not inundated by these waves. The only difference was that for some they entered inside, while for others only outside. And my always lovable Jesus told me, My daughter, I am the engine, and my love keeps the engine in motion and pours over everyone. But for those who want to receive these waves, if they are empty and they love me, they enter into them while the others are just touched in order to be disposed to receive such a great good. As for the souls who do my will and live in it, then they are inside the engine itself. And since they live of me, they can dispose of the waves that gush out for the good of others, and are now light that illuminates, now fire that ignites, now water that purifies. How beautiful it is to see these souls who live of my will coming out from within my engine, like as many other little engines, diffusing themselves for the good of all. And then they return into the engine and disappear from the midst of creatures, as they live of me and me alone. December 5th, 1921, Volume 13 one who does not accept the gifts of God is ungrateful. The gift of the divine will was given to Louisa from the time of the renewal of mystical marriage before the Holy Trinity, 32 years before. Doubts and Difficulties Jesus answers them in advance. After I wrote that which is said above, I felt all concerned and more than ever annihilated. And as I began to pray, my always lovable Jesus came and clasping me tightly to his heart told me, Daughter of my will, why do you not want to recognize the gifts that your Jesus wants to give you? This is highest in gratitude. Imagine a king surrounded by his faithful ministers and a poor boy, barefooted and ragged, who, taken by love of seeing the king, goes up to the royal palace, and making himself smaller than he is, looks at the king from behind the ministers, and then lowers himself for fear of being discovered. The king notices this, and while the boy is huddled behind the ministers, he calls him and takes him aside. The little one trembles and blushes, fearing of being punished. But the king presses him to his heart and says to him, Do not fear. I took you aside to tell you that I want to raise you above all. I want you to surpass all the gifts that I gave to my ministers. Nor do I want you to leave my royal palace ever again. If the boy is good, he will accept with love the proposal of the king. He will tell everyone of how good the king is. He will say it to the ministers, calling everyone to thank the king. If then he is ungrateful, he will refuse to accept, saying, What do you want from me? I am a little one, poor, ragged, and barefooted. These gifts are not for me. And he will keep in his heart the secret of his ingratitude. Is this not a horrendous ingratitude? And what will happen to that boy? So you are, because you see yourself unworthy, you would rather get rid of my gifts. And I, my love, you are right. But what concerns me the most is that you always want to speak about me. And he, it is right. It is necessary that I speak about you. Would it be nice if a bridegroom who is about to marry his bride were forced to deal with others, but not with her? 
while it is necessary that they confide their secrets to each other, that one know what the other has, that their parents provide this couple with a dowry, and that they become used to each other's ways in advance. And I added, Tell me, my life, who is my family? What is my dowry and yours? And smiling, he continued, Your family is the Trinity. Don't you remember that in the first years of bed I took you to heaven and we celebrated our union before the Most Holy Trinity? It endowed you with such gifts that you yourself have not yet known. And as I speak to you about my will, about its effects and value, I make you discover the gifts with which, from that time, you were endowed. I do not speak to you about my dowry, because what is mine is yours. And then, after a few days, we, the three divine persons, descended from heaven, took possession of your heart, and formed our perpetual residence in it. We took the reins of your intelligence, of your heart, and of all of yourself. And everything you did was an outpouring of our creative will over you, and the confirmation that your will was animated by an eternal will. The work is already done. There is nothing left but to make it known, so that not only you, but others also may take part in these great goods. And this I am doing by calling now one minister, now another, and even ministers from places afar, to make known to them these great truths. Therefore this thing is mine, not yours, so let me do. Even more you must know that every time you manifest one additional value of my will, I feel so much contentment that I love you with multiplied love. And I, blushing about my difficulties, said, My highest and only good, see how I have become more bad. Before I used to have no doubts about what you told me. Now? No. How many doubts, how many difficulties? I myself don't know where I go fishing for them. And Jesus, do not worry about this either. Many times I myself cause these difficulties in order to answer not only you, confirming to you the truths that I tell you, but to answer all those who, in reading these truths, may find doubts and difficulties. I answer them in advance, so that they may find light and all of their difficulties may be dissolved. Criticism will not be lacking, therefore everything is necessary. December 5th, 1928, Volume 25. For one who does the divine will and lives in it, it is as if she made the sun descend upon earth. Difference. I was feeling all immersed in the divine volition. I feel my poor and little mind bound to a point of light extremely high that has no boundaries, and one can see neither where its height reaches nor where its depth ends. And while the mind fills itself with light, it is surrounded by light to the point of seeing nothing but light. It sees that it takes little of this light because there is so much of it, but its capacity is so small that it seems to it that it takes just a few little drops. Oh, how well one feels in the midst of this light, because it is life, it is word, it is happiness. The soul feels within herself all the reflections of her creator and feels the divine life being given birth within her bosom. Oh, divine will, how admirable you are! You alone are the fecundator, the preserver, and the bilocator of the life of God in the creature. But while my mind was wandering within the light of the supreme fiat, my sweet Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, 
my daughter, with the soul who lives in my divine will, it is more than if I made the sun descend upon earth. What would happen then? The night would be banished from the earth. It would always be full daylight. And by always having contact with the sun, the earth would no longer be a dark body, but a luminous one. And it would not beg for the effects of the sun, but would receive into itself the very substance of the effects of the light, because sun and earth would live communal life and would form one single life. What a difference is there not between the sun in the height of its sphere and the earth in its lowness? The poor earth is subject to the night, to seasons, and to asking the sun to form the beautiful flowerings, the colors, the sweetness, the maturity of its fruits. And the sun is not free to display all of its effects over the earth, if the earth does not lend itself to receive them, so much so that certain points of the earth the sun does not always reach, and other points are dry and without plants. This is nothing other than a simile of one who does my divine will and lives in it, and one who lives in the earth of her human volition. The first makes descend not only the sun of my divine will into her soul, but the whole of heaven. Therefore with this sun she possesses the perennial day, a day that never sets, because the light has the virtue of putting darkness to flight. So the night of passions, the night of weaknesses, of miseries, of coldnesses, of temptations, cannot be there with this sun. And if they wanted to draw near to form the seasons in the soul, the sun beats down its rays and puts all nights to rushed flight, saying, I am here and that's enough. My seasons are seasons of light, of peace, of happiness, and of perennial flowering. This soul is the bearer of heaven upon earth. On the other hand, for one who does not do my divine will and does not live in it, it is more nighttime than daytime in her soul. She is subject to seasons and to long rainy times that render her always disturbed and labored or to long droughts in which she reaches the point of lacking the vital humors in order to love her creator. And the very son of my divine will, because it does not live in her, is not free to give her all the good it possesses. Do you see what it means to possess my divine volition? It is to possess the source of life, of light, and of all goods. On the other hand, one who does not possess it is like the earth that enjoys the effects of the light and like certain lands that are just barely illuminated but without effects. December 5th, 1938, Volume 36 God sighs for souls to live in his will. How it is established that he will form a divine life for each created thing and for each act the creature will do in his will. How his sanctity and his love will remain formed in them. The ocean of the divine will is always murmuring, forming its huge waves to assault the creature, now with light, now with love, now with enchanting beauty, now with its sighs longing for a little place in the creatures, to be able to live in them. Its love is unspeakable. It would reach the excesses. It would use all its stratagems of love to have the freedom to live and make us live in its fiat. I remained surprised in seeing this, and my adorable Jesus told me, Daughter of my will, you don't know the extent our love reaches and what we will do to make the creature live in our will. This is the most beautiful point of creation, and if we didn't do so, we could say that our work is not accomplished 
or that we have not done what we know how to do and can do. We could say that we haven't done anything of what is still left to do. You must know that it has been established from eternity that we will form in ourselves a life for each created thing and for each act the creature will do in our will. Since our being is superior to all, it is right that it surpasses in its lives the number of all created things and all the acts of the human family. But if the creature does not live in our will, we cannot do this. The divine material would be missing in order to form our life in her acts. The place in which to put it would be missing. Forming our lives without someone to receive them. What for? See then how this is really the most beautiful, the most powerful and wisest act. It is about exposing the lives that we have already generated in our womb. But we cannot deliver them because our will does not reign. Do you think it is trivial that something is still missing in the work of creation? It is the most interesting act, the culminating point in which the creation and all the acts will be wrapped with a beauty so rare, with a blooming so great that the beauty that creatures have known of us and the glory that they gave us in the past will all remain like little drops. My daughter, oh, how much we long for it. How much our delirious love is yearning and sighing for the creature to live in our will. And since we know that she will be lacking many things for us in order to use her acts to form our life, we are available to work continuously to compensate for anything. In each of her acts, we will give her our love, sanctity, goodness, and beauty, so that nothing can miss of what is needed to form our life. We will generate and reproduce ourselves, and oh, how much love, sanctity, and goodness we will receive in return. How could we not sigh for the creatures to live in our will? Not only would we have the creatures, but also our very life generated in their acts. While enjoying one life, another one will be coming, and another, according to all the acts they will do. As soon as we see that the creature is about to do one act, we will position ourselves, becoming actors and spectators of our very life. What joy! What happiness, my daughter, to be able to form ourselves, to have someone who knows us and loves us, to possess our royal palace within the creature, Further, there is the great good that the creature will receive. Her little sanctity will remain in ours. Her little love will remain in our love. Her goodness and beauty within ours. In this way, if she does a holy act, she will have our sanctity in her power. If she loves, she will love with our love, and so forth. All her acts will rise from within our acts, so she will love us always, and we will feel always loved. She will grow more and more in sanctity, goodness, and beauty, and with this she will acquire ever new knowledge of the love of her Creator. She will feel it palpitating in her acts. My will will reveal to her ever new things about our divine being to make her appreciate more our life that she possesses. The knowledge will make new love arise by communicating more truths about our beauty. It won't stop telling her new things as if feeding her with what we are. The happy creature will feel as if caught in the net of our love, invested by our light and by the enchantment of our beauty and we will be so enraptured by her love that we will take refuge within her to love and to release our love. 
We will embellish her so much that we will let ourselves be conquered by such a rare beauty. All other things are like little drops compared to the living of the creature in our will. Therefore be attentive. If you live in my will, you will give me the greatest joy and will make me happy. After this, I kept on thinking about the great good of living in the divine will. And my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, this good is so great that I vividly feel our life palpitating in the creature, so much so that we no longer need any words in order to make ourselves understood. Our breath in hers is word that invests the whole human being, turning it into our word. It speaks in the mind, in the works, in the steps. The virtue of our creative word invests her in such a way as to be felt inside the most intimate fibers of her heart. I turn the creature into my very word. My word becomes her nature. Not doing what I say and want would be as if going against herself. This cannot be. For one who lives in my will, I am the word in the breathing, in the motion, in the intelligence, in the glance, in everything, to the extent that, while feeling fused and soaked inside my word, not having heard the sound of my voice, she is surprised and says, I feel as if my nature has changed into his word, and I don't know when he spoke to me. And I... Don't you know that I am word in every instant? And although you aren't listening, I speak, knowing that when you will enter the room of your soul, you will find it, and will take the gift of my word. My words don't run away, but they remain and transform the human nature into themselves. There is such a union and a transformation that those who live in our will, and we ourselves, understand each other without talking, we speak without words. This is the greatest gift that we can give to the creature, to speak with her breath and motion. She identified with us in so much that we use the same modes with her that we use with ourselves. Since our divine being is all word and voice, when we do not want, we do not let anybody hear. Therefore, be attentive and let my will guide you in everything. End of December 5th Fiat 